I see my time is about up. But uh, I would counsel, before you change subjects, um, isn't it um, more accurate that the trial court actually found that the evidence met the Gregory standard? That was the last time Justice Clarence Thomas asked a question at the Supreme Court way back in February 2006. And so there was a lot of fuss Monday when Thomas leaned into his mic and spoke. He didn't say much, but today the court released the audio recording. And his, another of his counsel, Mr. Singer, uh, of the three that he had, he was a graduate of Harvard Law School, wasn't he? Yes, sir. So we go. Very Is that the minimum were, constitutional? He did not. <laughs> <laughs> and so hard to make out, but we have probably the two best men in the newsroom to try to try to parse it out, Bob Barnes, our Supreme Court uh, reporter, and Mike Fletcher, who wrote a biography on uh, Justice Thomas. So first, Bob, you were in the courtroom. What exactly was that all about? Well, this was a case about uh, a death row inmate in Louisiana, and there was a discussion about whether he had been represented by attorneys who were properly qualified. Uh, in questioning, it came out one of his attorneys had gone to Harvard, uh, one of his attorneys had gone to Yale, and then there was a bit of joking, and it appears that what Justice Thomas was joking about was whether that made them qualified or not. Uh, as you know, he has a bit of a love-hate relationship, mostly hate, uh, with Yale Law School where he went, although there has been a thaw in their relationship later. And so he was making a joke about whether that meant on its own that these lawyers were qualified or not. Uh, Mike, what does he have against Yale? <laughs> it's a layered kind of indictment. I we think. only have a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it starts with his feeling when he was a student at Yale Law School. He was an affirmative action student, but well qualified, but felt that he carried a stigma and felt that the elites at Yale kind of looked down on him a little bit. And then when he graduated from Yale Law School, he had a hard time getting a job, ended up working in the Attorney General's office in Missouri, not a very prestigious job coming out of Yale Law School, which led him to put an old cigar um, price tag on his Yale Law degree. It said 15 cents, and, and Tom would often say that's all that law degree was worth to him. And then later, during the confirmation for the Supreme Court, when Anita Hill made her charges, Yale did, you know, and they were both Yale alum. Um, you know, Yale couldn't and didn't, you know, back either one, essentially. They were kind of ambiguous in their support. I think Thomas felt like he needed, you know, he deserved their full support. So I think it's kind of a three-count indictment. And, Mike, there's a strange thing now where Thomas doesn't speak while all the other justices do quite a bit. Why is that? <laughs> he, he's offered a number of reasons. I'm going to give you my theory first. I think it's the kind of issue where the more people, writ large people in the media and others, make an issue of it. I think he has a type of personality where he's more determined not to speak because he feels like it's not that important. And secondly, he's talked about a number of things. He says he developed a habit of listening as a young man. He used to speak a Geechee dialect, a you know, coastal sort of southern dialect when he was a young person. And he worked very hard to get out of that. And he used to be embarrassed by it, he said. So he said through, sort of going through that process, he kind of developed a habit of listening, A. Eh? And he also says that oral arguments are kind of overrated. We should, you know, we have the cases in, you know, in the, um, in the, in the various documents that were submitted to the court, all the briefs and what have you, and we should let the advocates make their case and we shouldn't interrupt. And the other thing I was surprised by, the handful of times I've seen an oral argument, is how active he is speaking to the justices on either side of him, engaged in a way that you wouldn't get if you just listened to the audio. Right, he does. Uh, I mean, they're all engaged, but he does talk especially to Justice Breyer, who is his seatmate, uh, and uh, they whisper back and forth about the case. So he is involved in, uh, in the argument. He just doesn't ask questions. You know, let me ask, you know, add one thing, and interestingly, as quiet as he is during oral argument, he's probably, he's one of the more gregarious justices off the bench. When he speaks to students, he's very down to earth. Most of his speeches aren't really about some corner of the law, but really often about his own life. Right. Mike and Bob, thanks. I'm glad we were able to use this little silly piece of audio as an excuse to have this conversation. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks.